It's the Adam Ragusea Podcast, episode 73. Why do all celebrities seem to own a restaurant? I mean, all or part of a restaurant? Why would celebrities do this to themselves? Because depending on which analysis you look at, something like 60% of independent restaurants, you know, not national chains like McDonald's, but like normal independent restaurants, about 60% of them fail within their first three years. This is according to a 2005 study out of Ohio State that, despite its age and limits, remains probably the best word on this phenomenon in the United States. 60% of new restaurants fail. And the profit margins are horrible. For a full-service restaurant, the average profit is around 3 to 5%. That means for every dollar that you spend running your business, you get like three cents back in profit because the food and the labor and the overhead costs in a restaurant are just enormous. There are industries out there with like 30, 40, 50% profit margins. Get into financial services, for God's sake, if you want cushy margins. The restaurant business is a terrible business by nearly any objective measure of dollar and cents. And yet, nearly every famous actor or musician you could think of owns at least part of at least some restaurant. Hankering for some good North African food in Beverly Hills? Well, who isn't? Try Tajine, co-owned by Brian Gosling. Why? Why did he invest in a restaurant of all things? Didn't anybody tell him he's Kenuff without that millstone hanging around his neck? Want some Korean barbecue in Lower Manhattan? Well, obviously, you'd want to check out Quentin Tarantino's Do Hua in the West Village. Oh, wait, you can't because Do Hua closed in 2018, because that's what restaurants do. Restaurants close more often than they do anything else. At least Jay-Z was smart enough to know that the profit margin is at the bar, not in the kitchen. So he went for like a, a bar lounge concept called the 4040 Club in the Flatiron District. Oh, wait, that closed too, like a month ago. I guess he still has a second location. And when Jimmy Buffett died this past week, all the obits mentioned that he died a billionaire with a B. The list of musician billionaires is like Paul McCartney, Bono, Jay-Z, Jimmy Buffett. I guess now we can scratch Jimmy's name off that particular list now that he's gone from skin cancer, a more poetic demise for a beach bum having never been conceived. He died a billionaire. So Jimmy's restaurant empire must have been going gangbusters, right? For the non-parrot-headed among you, Jimmy Buffett was a boomer born in the tiny little strip of Mississippi that's actually on the ocean. Part of the greater Florabama region, you could say. Jimmy Buffett's combination of rural white people music, country music, and the sounds of the Gulf of Mexico and the Caribbean. This was as marketable a combination as any that has ever existed in the music business. Jimmy Buffett had the original snap track, y'all. He had that laid back redneck Riviera vibe long before Kenny Chesney or whoever's tapping that well these days. My dad says that one time when we were vacationing in Key West, as we often did when I was a kid because my dad loves Key West, my dad says that he walked by an establishment where Jimmy Buffett was playing and he overheard Jimmy say into the mic, well, I guess you want to hear the damn song again. And the crowd roared as he launched into Margaritaville, a song about an alcoholic frittering away what remains of his life, money, and brain cells at some cheesy resort. Cheese doesn't really strike me as like a hot weather food. But when they opened a cheeseburger in paradise bar and grill in the sprawl outside of Bloomington, Indiana, when Lauren and I used to live there, well, we just had to check it out. Cheeseburger in paradise is another of Jimmy Buffett's songs, and it was the basis of a restaurant chain. 
Lauren and I went some years ago. We had some totally forgettable sliders, as I recall, while a white guy with an acoustic guitar sang Stevie Wonder's Superstition into a mic that had way too much bass on his voice. Side note, guys with acoustic guitars, just stop. Just stop. Stop it with your busking. Stop guilting your friend who works at a restaurant into talking to her boss about letting you play there Thursday night. Live music is not nearly as valuable or as desirable as it used to be. It used to be that if you wanted to hear some music while you ate, you needed a troop of minstrels in the room. Not any longer. We have recorded music. It's less obtrusive and generally better than what you play. You are not playing for us. And you damn well know that. You're playing for yourself. This is about you and your music career. End quote. The rest of us in the room are just collateral damage. Take it somewhere else, for God's sake. I'm slightly more tolerant of nearly any music form other than a white guy with an acoustic guitar, just because it's so rare to encounter anything else in my ecosystem, but... Even if it's a, like really, really good music, I'm eating and I want to talk to my friend, okay? Shut off that damn racket. No one wants this except you, pan flute guy, playing pan flute karaoke with a CD of New Age backing tracks on the boombox next to his tip jar. The other thing I remember about Cheeseburger in Paradise in Bloomington, Indiana was all of the like marine-themed tchotchkes on the wall. I remember thinking, huh, it was someone's job to source that distressed buoy hanging over Lauren's head. And then, lo and behold, like 15 years later, here in Tennessee, just the other day, I happened to meet the antique dealer whose job it was to source all of the tchotchkes that hang inside the Ruby Tuesday family restaurant chain, which is based here in Knoxville. And I was like, oh, I knew that had to be a real job. Anyway, we did not go back to Cheeseburger in Paradise in Bloomington. And I guess not many other people did either because it closed in 2011. Or at least 2011 is when the Yelp reviews abruptly end. Quote, Overall, it's all right. Just know what you're getting yourself into. Three stars for what it is. Probably 1.5 if you're looking for good food. Here's another one. Quote, The workers are called islanders, and I'm sure they are proud of that, as evidenced by their slow, unfriendly service. I would not waste my money here ever again. Here's the best one. Quote, I am embarrassed for you just yelping cheeseburger in paradise. You're in Bloomington with a ton of amazing restaurants. This is not one of them. Buffett's holding company sold off the cheeseburger in paradise chain in 2012 for $11 million. And $11 million is good money, but a billionaire it does not make. The restaurant business is a bad business. Costs are enormous. It's extremely labor intensive, which means you're going to have nonstop labor issues. It serves a fickle public that loves you one minute and despises you the next just because some trend flipped or somebody got sick after eating your food and they posted a viral video about it, even though actual food epidemiologists will tell you that it's almost never your most recent meal that made you sick because foodborne infections have incubation periods of days or weeks or even months. The restaurant business is terrible. Why do some of the world's most successful people keep trying it? Guys, it's time for some game theory. I think we can game this out together without focusing too much on any one specific real world case. Though we will get back to Jimmy Buffett by the end and we will talk about how he died a billionaire. Reason number one why celebrities invest in restaurants. Because they need to invest in something and restaurants are what they know. 
There is not a perfect positive correlation between wealth and fame, but the correlation exists nonetheless, and if you are famous, you generally have to be real stupid or real reckless to not also be rich. Quite a few celebrities are stupid and or reckless, but not all of them are. A lot of them have a lot of money. And because inflation exists, money that isn't making money is losing money. So you have to invest. The smartest thing is probably to just turn your money over to a firm that will spread your savings thinly across a million different companies you've never heard of. But you may be tempted to do the dumb thing, which is to dump a whole lot of your money into a single business that you happen to like. And celebrities like restaurants. I mean, everybody likes restaurants, but celebrities can afford to go to them much more frequently. And if they're the kind of celebrity that actually enjoys getting recognized and like shaking hands and feeling people whispering about you at every other table in the restaurant, well, then restaurants really are your happy place if you're that kind of person. Plus, if you're a celebrity, you think you know what makes a good restaurant because you eat out all the time and you've developed some strong feelings about what works and what doesn't. So you think you know how to run a restaurant. But this is, of course, an illusion or a delusion, I guess you could say. Because, you know, a million frequent flyer miles do not entitle you to fly the jet. And there's a good reason for that. Using a service and providing a service are just two profoundly different things. But hey, Justin Timberlake and Jessica Biel cook at home all the time. How different could it be running a restaurant? Narrator voice. Justin Timberlake's Southern Hospitality Barbecue on the Upper East Side closed in 2012, and Jessica Biel's All Fudge in West Hollywood closed in 2018, because that's what restaurants do. They clothes. But you're a celebrity, and you have money, and that money needs to go somewhere. And you mostly go to restaurants. So you figure your money can go to the restaurant with you. This leads us to reason number two why celebrities always own restaurants. Because they know a guy. Let's say that you're Ryan Gosling. You attend a lot of catered affairs because you're a fancy person living the good life. And as we've discussed previously... One of the most historically viable routes by which a working person could make a connection with a rich person is by performing domestic work, such as cooking. I quote now from the chef biography section of the website for Tajine Restaurant in Beverly Hills. Quote, a catering opportunity in Hollywood put the chef's dishes in the company of many well-known celebrities, including a then rising star, Ryan Gosling. A few empty plates later, Ryan inquired about the caterer, insisting it was food he would eat every day for the rest of his life. The two became instant friends, and after some time talking, they agreed that there was something missing in L.A., the kind of place that made you feel warm and satisfied, a place where the food is made with love. Yes, I'm sure there's no other eating establishments in the greater Los Angeles area where the food is made with love. Anyway, this is a common story. Celebrity eats food. Celebrity likes food. Gets to talking with the chef. Likes the chef. The celebrity says, hey, if you're ever looking for investors, let me know. And it's something the celebrity says after several glasses of wine. Mostly they say it just so they can feel like a big shot. But then the chef calls the next day and you're kind of committed. This is basically what happened between Robert De Niro and the great sushi chef Nobu Matsuhisa. Nobu was the hottest sushi restaurant in L.A. in the late 1980s. That place did a lot to popularize sushi in this country. Because like when your favorite movie and TV characters in the early 90s were talking about sushi all the time, it was because some of the producers and the actors and the screenwriters had been eating at Nobu. Roland Jaffe, who had just directed Robert De Niro in The Mission, took the actor to Nobu around uh, 1988, and presumably after a few glasses of sake, De Niro said, Hey, if you ever want to open a place on the East Coast, let me know about it. And Nobu seems to be one of the few celebrity-funded restaurant empires that's actually successful. 
They have dozens of locations all over the world. In 2015, the Australian billionaire James Packer bought a 20% stake in the Nobu chain for $100 million. From that, we can reasonably extrapolate that the company as a whole is worth at least a billion. Not every celebrity is as lucky as De Niro was to run into a chef like Nobu. I bet for a lot of celebrities, the chef is just a guy they know. Probably from their youth, from back in the day, back in the old neighborhood. Everybody knew Joey made the best meatballs. Then Joey's friend becomes a movie star and Joey says, hey man, if I just had like 200 grand, I could start up the place of our dreams. And the dream typically becomes a nightmare as Joey puts the entire investment up his nose. I know a lot of people in the restaurant business, and here's something that people in ownership always say. They say, you gotta be there. Someone with an ownership stake some kind of like sweat equity or otherwise, somebody with an ownership stake needs to be on premises most of the time. Elbows deep in the food or elbows deep in the books or even better with the food and the books. The restaurant industry is one where your employees will rob you blind. It's a cash heavy business, which makes it very easy for employees to skim a little here and there. It's a chaotic business. And remember that chaos is a ladder. The inventory is expensive and easily stolen via consumption. How are you going to prove that I ate that last filet, chef? You're going to cut my stomach open and examine its contents? I mean, I know you'd like to, but the Occupational Safety and Health Administration tends to frown on such management practices. Hey, if you're looking for some employees who won't rob you blind, consider finding them with Indeed, sponsor of this episode. 81% of U.S. online job seekers are looking for jobs on Indeed every month, according to Comscore, and Indeed is the platform where you can attract, interview, and hire all in one place. You've got your own business to worry about, making burgers or virtual burgers or whatever it is that you do, and you don't need to be bouncing between 100 different job boards looking for help. Indeed is all you need. They streamline the whole process with powerful tools that find you matched candidates. With Instant Match, over 80% of employers get quality candidates whose resume on Indeed matches their job description the moment they sponsor a job, according to Indeed's U.S. data. You can start hiring now with a $75 sponsored job credit to upgrade your job post at Indeed.com slash Ragusea. Offer good for a limited time. Oh, and get this, Indeed is the only job site where you only pay for applications that meet your must-have requirements. Three million businesses worldwide use Indeed for a reason. Claim your $75 credit now at Indeed.com slash Ragusea. Use my link so that the uh, Ragusea pod gets credit. That's important to keeping my operation profitable enough to sustain for everyone's benefit. Indeed.com slash Ragusea. Terms and conditions apply. Need to hire? You need indeed. Anyway, point is, it is very hard to run a profitable restaurant without being there. And celebrities do not want to be there. Can you blame them? Do you want to walk the red carpet tonight? Or do you want to shuck oysters for some asshole to eat with ketchup on top? Celebrities start restaurants because they know a guy. And sometimes the guy is a member of the family. Sometimes you're Mark and Donnie Wahlberg and you got 15 other brothers to feed and they can't all be in the funky bunt. So you give some money to your brother, Paul Wahlberg, to open a restaurant. I have not watched any of the reality TV shows about Wahlbergers, but I imagine it does not show Paul Wahlberg sniffing the investment up his nose because Wahlbergers is still around and still, apparently, successful. Wahlbergers, where you can eat the polar opposite of the food that Mark Wahlberg actually eats to stay ripped for the movies. It's amazing how far a celebrity endorsement can take a consumer-facing business like a restaurant, which leads us to reason number three that celebrities all have restaurants, because celebrity endorsements work. 
for certain kinds of businesses, like restaurants and other retail businesses that primarily serve the general public. Most businesses serve other businesses. The global business-to-business market is more than twice the size of the global business-to-consumer market, according to a number of market research firms. Just Google it. If I'm a paperclip company and I'm looking for a new source of galvanized steel wire, I'm going to make that choice based upon the cost of the wire, its tensile strength, how reliable I think that company is going to be at getting me wire on a regular basis, etc. I'm probably not going to choose a galvanized wire distributor on the basis that it is attached to Marky Mark's brother. In contrast, if I'm bumming the streets of Boston and I want a burger for lunch, I have so many options. There's Tasty Burger. There's Boston Burger Company. There used to be four burgers and you burger which were my favorite burger places back when I lived in Boston, even though I could never figure out if it was supposed to be pronounced you burger as in like a burger for you, or U-Burger, a portmanteau of Uber and burger, meaning the best burger. Those places closed because closing is what restaurants do, but there's still a million amazing burger places in a town like Boston. How to choose? Well... There's a step-by-step decision-making process that Donnie Wahlberg can guide you through. Step one, 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 we can have lots of fun. Step two, dude, there's so much we can do. Step three, 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 it's just you and me. Step four, 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 consider whether you feel a tribal connection with the owners of this establishment, tenuous or illusory as that tribal connection may be. It's a great song. The Wahlberg Brood is an inspiration to every other overpopulated working class Irish Catholic household in the triple decker multifamily homes of Dorchester. So if I'm also a Bruins fan who's never at the job site without a donkey's coffee in his gloved hand, yeah, I'm going to go to the Wahlberg place for lunch instead of U Burger or U Burger or whatever it was. It's gone. But, but Wahlberger is still there. Because celebrity endorsements work to some extent for consumer-facing businesses. Business-to-business arrangements are often much more profitable and stable. Celebrities might make a lot more money investing in B2B firms, business-to-business, but a celebrity's name isn't going to be very helpful in that situation. And their name is generally the most valuable thing that any celebrity owns. That said, celebrities probably are invested in all kinds of B2B firms that we don't even know about. Helen Mirren probably doesn't talk very much about all the strip malls that she owns in Scottsdale or whatever, because there's no reason for her to talk about that. A retailer is not going to choose its location in a strip mall based on the fact that Helen Mirren owns this one. In contrast... When a celebrity owns a restaurant, they can dramatically improve business by shouting, come to my restaurant from the rooftops, while the fine print underneath reads, "Uh, Mr. Wahlberg is not guaranteed to be on site during your visit. But sometimes the celebrity really is hanging out in the dining room, frequently, and this leads us to reason number four celebrities all own restaurants. They want clubhouses. As a mildly internet-famous person, I can tell you that fame feels awful. Having lots of people know things about you while you know nothing about them is a very destabilizing, disorienting feeling. It makes you feel very vulnerable and exposed. It's like being naked under a spotlight in an otherwise darkened hall. Fame is only good in the sense that what I'm doing right now beats, you know, actually working for a living. The only part of my personality that actually likes being famous is the part of my personality that has narcissistic tendencies. I have a little bit of that in me, and that little voice in my head loves being famous. Now, the other, much bigger, much louder voices in my head tend to shout down the little voice that loves being famous, 
But I have to admit that that little voice does remain. I reckon that other famous people are much less conflicted about fame because they're straight up narcissists or sociopaths or something. Personality disorders abound in Hollywood and in Washington because only people with a pathological need for attention actually like being famous, which is why pretty much only terrible people want to run for major political office. I'm still on the side of democracy, but this is a really bad problem inherent to representative democracy, especially in the age of mass media. If you have a hereditary monarchy, at least you get rulers with an array of different personality types. But if you elect your ruler, you pretty much only get one kind of guy. And fuck that guy. I am so tired of that guy. Anyway. Lots of celebrities get to be celebrities because they are people pleasers. They love to schmooze. How many Yiddish words are we up to in today's episode yet? Celebrities love to schmooze. And if they open up their own restaurant, they can schmooze every night if they want to. I'm sure it's awesome. You get to walk in there like you own the place because you do. Everybody from the bartender to the general manager works for you, and therefore they all have every motivation to kiss your ass and to save you the good seat. Of course, you can always save yourself the good seat at home with HelloFresh, sponsor of this episode. Go to HelloFresh.com slash 50Ragusea and use code 50Ragusea for 50% off plus 15% off the next two months. Some people think it's weird that an internet cook such as myself would endorse a meal kit delivery service. That's exactly why I love HelloFresh. I am busy. I'm coming up with recipes and grocery shopping all the time. Two or three nights out of the week, I am overjoyed to pass that work on to somebody else. HelloFresh recipes are foolproof. I usually get the vegetarian boxes because they help me to eat less meat, but there's a million different meal plans you can sign up for. The recipes are tight. The boxes are pre-portioned so that you'll have little, if any, ingredient left over to deal with. That's probably my favorite part. A HelloFresh box is generally going to be cheaper than takeout. The produce comes to your door from the farm in less than seven days. Most of the meals take 20 or 30 minutes to make, but there are 15-minute meals that you can sign up for, too. The menu always includes 40 recipes and over 100 add-on items to choose from every week, like desserts and party platters and such. You gotta try cooking with HelloFresh. Go to HelloFresh.com slash 50Ragusea and use code 50Ragusea for 50% off plus 15% off the next two months. That's code 50Ragusea for 50% off. Thank you, HelloFresh. Anyway, celebrities tend to be narcissistic or at least highly extroverted. That's how they got to be celebrities. And one reason that they might own a restaurant is so that it can be their clubhouse, their hangout, where they entertain all their friends. And when there are no Hollywood friends available to entertain, well, you can just saunter into your restaurant and hang out with the normals as if you own the place because you do. And you can order rounds of drinks on the house because you are the house, etc., Even if your star is fading, there's still one place you can go where everybody knows your name. Indeed, the TV show Cheers is all about a washed-up baseball player in Boston who opens up a bar where the only 12 Red Sox fans who still remember him fondly will come and buy a beer and make him feel like he's a somebody. It remains not a great business to be in, money-wise, which leads us to the fifth and final reason why celebrities all own restaurants. They don't. Often, they only seem to own a restaurant, but in fact, they're actually in a much better business. Think, for example, how does a YouTuber, of all things, suddenly own a burger chain across 300 cities overnight? That's what Mr. Beast did. Jimmy, the other Jimmy we're going to talk about today. For my fellow 
olds out there who might not know, the current king of YouTube is 25-year-old Jimmy Donaldson of Greenville, North Carolina, known as Mr. Beast. He's most famous for staging elaborate stunts where he gives away obscene amounts of his obscene YouTube money. I have 2 million YouTube subscribers, and I will probably never work a real job ever again in my life. Mr. Beast is a hundred times my size. Because he is legitimately much more popular, but also because he's an ambitious and energetic young man, unlike myself, hence his entrepreneurialism. Hence, Mr. Beast Burger. I remember one of my kids telling me like a year or two ago, Hey, Daddy, Mr. Beast just started a burger restaurant, and I want a Mr. Beast Burger tonight. But you don't eat burgers. You're like the one child in this entire universe who won't eat burgers or pizza. But I'll try a Mr. Beast Burger... I mean, if you'll actually try it, I'll, I'll buy you pretty much anything to eat. But if Mr. Beast just opened a new restaurant, I doubt that it's in Knoxville, Tennessee. Oh, wait, it is? How is that possible? It was possible because Mr. Beast didn't actually have a restaurant in Knoxville or anywhere else for that matter. If we had ordered Mr. Beast delivery that night... Our food would have been prepared in a ghost kitchen somewhere in Knoxville. A ghost kitchen is a kitchen that other businesses hire to make their food and then to deliver that food under the hiring business's brand. A ghost kitchen can simply be excess or unused kitchen space that's in the back of like a normal brick and mortar restaurant Or it can be like a commercial commissary in an industrial park somewhere. The point is, you, the consumer, you put in an online order, somebody at the ghost kitchen prepares it, and then a door dasher or some such drives your food to your house. If you want to have a national restaurant chain tomorrow, all you have to do is hire Virtual Dining Concepts of Orlando, Florida, which maintains a vast network of ghost kitchens all over the United States. You give them some product specifications, some recipes, and they take care of the actual product and fulfillment and all of that. You just handle the marketing. What could go wrong? Well, do a Google image search for Mr. Beast Burger Fail And you'll see what could go wrong. There's burgers that are fully raw on the inside. Burgers that arrive smashed into little bits. All kinds of unverifiable claims. A social media scandal need not have any basis in reality to be a scandal. But I have no trouble believing that quality control is nearly impossible in a ghost kitchen based business. Think about how hard quality control is in like a nationwide chain where you own all the locations directly and all the employees work for you. That's hard enough. But now imagine a system where you own nothing and employ no one. Some guy with an app makes your burger, slaps your logo on it, and another guy with an app drives it to the customer. There is no opportunity for quality control on your part. Ghost kitchen-based businesses are everywhere now. It was a way for restaurants to try to make at least a little money with their kitchens back when their doors were closed because of COVID. Every town is Flavor Town now, thanks to Guy Fieri's new virtual restaurant. Guy works up the recipe, some rando in your town cooks it, And then someone has to walk it up the stairs to your apartment or for whatever, for whatever meager tip you can muster on the app. What could go wrong? Not surprisingly, Mr. Beast's business relationship with virtual dining concepts has descended into litigation as of this writing. Lawsuit filed July 31st. The complaint from Jimmy's lawyers states, quote, Because virtual dining concepts was more focused on rapidly expanding the business as a way to pitch the virtual restaurant model to other celebrities for its own benefit, it was not focused on controlling the quality of Mr. Beast Burger customer experience and products. 
End quote. Jimmy Donaldson seems like a nice young man who is far more conscientious about his impact on the world than any of his peers, most of whom I gather are Paul brothers. I wish Mr. Beast no ill will. He seems like a good guy. I'm just saying sometimes the reason it seems like every celebrity has a restaurant is because some of them don't have a restaurant. It only looks like they do. Which brings us back to the other Jimmy that we started with. Uncle Jimmy. RSVP Jimmy Buffett. The man who brought you such hits as Why Don't We Get Drunk and Screw? How did that guy die a billionaire this past week? Well, I could point out that he was a journalist originally. Jimmy Buffett wrote for Billboard before his singing career ever took off. Journalism is a pretty good foundation for lots of other more gainful careers, I have certainly found. I don't know if Jimmy Buffett was legit a talented man of business or if he was just lucky enough to associate himself with legit talented business people early on in his career. But he just seems to make like epically smart decision after epically smart decision. One being his choice to focus on licensing above other business models. Why bother making a product? Why bother sourcing raw materials? Why bother hiring armies of messy, needy humans to add value to these raw materials? Why bother selling these value-added products to a fickle public and dealing with their complaints? If you get into the licensing business, somebody else does all of that. All you do is sell them your name. You sell a license to a company that wants to make t-shirts with your face or your song title on it or whatever it is. That company does all the work and assumes all the risk. You just cash your licensing check. Looking at the late Jimmy Buffett's business empire, seems that he did a lot more than just license the title of Margaritaville. He seemed to create holding companies that retained at least some partial equity stake in the Margaritaville restaurant chain, for example, but he seems to have focused more on licensing his brand to others. Far less risk that way, and you don't have to be good at business beyond being smart enough to focus on licensing. Lots of people much smarter and better informed than me have written deep dives into Donald Trump's business empire. I have read a number of those pieces through the years even from before Trump was a politician. Trump has so many failed businesses in his wake that it's easy to lose count. Probably his most famous failure was the Trump Plaza Hotel and Casino in Atlantic City, New Jersey. As wise people have pointed out before me, you have to be a special kind of idiot to lose money in the casino business. Trump's company used to build and occasionally manage properties itself. But in more recent years, Trump has focused more on licensing his name and image to other businesses because licensing requires no talent or intelligence whatsoever, save for the intelligence that it took to notice that licensing is the better business to get into. It's great work if you can get it. Licensing is all you have to do is get really famous. People who have actually looked at the Trump organization in detail have observed that for decades now, it has chiefly existed as a shitty lifestyle brand. It's what poor people imagine wealth to look like. That impression is what the Trump organization sells. They license Trump's name to other companies that run themselves into the ground instead of Trump having to run them into the ground personally, and thus his failures never seem to stick to him. Teflon Don, they used to call Trump, long before he ever got into politics. Or, these other businesses use Trump's name to launder money. Allegedly. The Trump brand is a poor person's idea of wealth, which is great, except poor people don't really have a lot of money. So, maybe you license Trump's name to slap on your hotel in Panama City or Azerbaijan or wherever because stupid people expect a Trump-branded hotel is going to make a lot of money and therefore you can launder your drug money, allegedly, through said hotel. Or your terrorism money, 
as in the case of that Azerbaijani Trump hotel, which uh, Adam Davidson reported in The New Yorker, sure seemed like it was set up as a money laundering operation for Iran's Revolutionary Guard. Trump can, of course, deny all of it because, hey, it was just a licensing deal. I really wouldn't be surprised if some of the frozen margarita machine companies that Jimmy Buffett licensed his name to over the years were also money laundering operations, but no evidence to that effect is forthcoming. How did Jimmy Buffett die a billionaire? Probably because he met Warren Buffett. No relation, even though they called each other Uncle Jimmy and Cousin Jimmy. The two men had such a natural affinity for each other that they actually took a DNA test to find out if they're related. Turns out they're both 100% dat cash. I have no inside knowledge of Jimmy Buffett's affairs, now managed by his estates, but here's my guess. My educated guess is that Jimmy Buffett made himself a millionaire by writing goofy songs about rednecks on vacation. He made himself a multimillionaire investing those royalties into brick-and-mortar businesses and through licensing deals. Then he made himself a billionaire by investing his millions in Berkshire Hathaway, Warren Buffett's conglomerate holding company that invests primarily in what now? Real estate? Yeah, Berkshire Hathaway owns a whole lot of real estate and a whole lot of factories and... 9% of Coca-Cola and 6% of Apple and all of that, but Berkshire Hathaway's primary business is insurance, mostly car insurance, Geico, etc. So that's my bet about how Jimmy Buffett died a billionaire. My educated guess is that Jimmy was not a billionaire singer-songwriter or even a billionaire restaurateur. He was a billionaire insurance company investor. The insurance business, like the casino business, is one that only a special kind of idiot can mess up. Because the house always wins. Great work if you can get it. I'm quite glad to get this work, if you can call this work, whatever I just did into this microphone for the last 45 minutes or whatever it was. Remember, there's more to life than money just it's tough to live a life without money so make good choices i'll talk to you next time